because I say it um, so often when I come, but whether it was yesterday where the Church of God came together from other places or, you know, just this family here because there's love here. It's genuine amongst you and people feel it when they come in. Um, so don't ever lose that. Let God continue to move and blow through you and join you bring new ones in, you know, it's an amazing family here. I'm sure you already know, but you will see, and you will see as well, these guys here know how to love um, as God loves. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> right, so uh, get straight into it. Um, still doing this series on David. Uh, last week, we looked at the first part of David's story with Nabal and Abigail. That's in 1 Samuel 25, and, you know, if you wanted to put like a soap opera title on it, I guess it'd be like the beauty and the beasts because Abigail obviously shines in all her beauty and wisdom and uh, humility. And then you have David and Nabal who are quite frankly a little OTT and wiling out. Um, there's lots of, lots of anger, tempers and, and bloods are running high, you know, there's fighting talk and all the rest of it. However, however, as I said to you last week, humility was the word that God kind of gave um, to me for this story. So, humility we saw last week through Abigail. However, humility still has a role to play, even as we're looking at David and, surprisingly, at Nabal uh, as well. I'm going to start just by reading a bit. Um, so, I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 25. I'm going to go from verse 28 um, to 42. So, you know, just backdrop to that, David had asked Nabal for, um, well, some food for his men because they had protected Nabal's um, shepherds in the wilderness. Nabal basically said, no, I don't think so, and you're a bum uh, as well, so get out of my face. That I'm just summarizing here. You know, that, <laughs> that's what he actually did say that in the Word. No. Uh, so that, you know, and David, of course, <laughs> uh, it was the Aramaic, actually. <laughs> you know, very strong language. And um, But David, unfortunately, doesn't take it graciously and decides, right, you've insulted me, now I'm going to have you. Now I'm really going to have you. Takes 400 men, strap on your swords because we're going to we're going to slaughter them, basically. And um, Nabal's wife, Abigail, gets wind of this and decides that <gasps> something needs to be done. So she steps in in all humility, loads up some food, comes, falls on her face before David, and is like, you don't want to do this, basically. You do not want to do this. You're a man of God. Um, please forgive my husband. His name is a fool, and he's a fool. Just please, please uh, forgive us, and know that God has a plan and a purpose for you. And so that's where we left it. Um, we did say last week that Abigail managed to not only save her family and her family firm uh, and her own future, but she managed to get like a marriage proposal out of this to the king. So she, she was trading up, you know, but essentially she was looking to do something good and she did something really great. God was able to use her because she was humble. Today, so today we come to the part of the story now where kind of David is responding to all that Abigail has said, but I'll give you a little bit more of what she said too. So verse 28, 1 Samuel 25. Please forgive the offense of your slave, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you all your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord does for my Lord, in accordance with all the good that he has spoken concerning you and appoints you ruler over Israel, this will not become an obstacle to you or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord's having avenged himself. When the Lord deals well with my Lord, then remember your slave. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you, who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, there certainly would not have been left in the ball until the morning light, as much as one male. So David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, 
Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was having a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was cheerful within him, for he was very drunk. So he did not tell. So she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, so that he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of the shame inflicted on me by the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent a proposal to, proposal to Abigail to take her as wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent, has sent us to you to take you to him as wife. And she got up and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your slave is a servant to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Then Abigail got up quickly and rode on a donkey with her five female attendants who accompanied her, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David had also taken a Hinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michal, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galen. So we come into the story today where we're looking at David's response. We saw all the wonderful things that Abigail did. We saw the humility and the wisdom that she showed and the way that God used her to actually restrain, to restrain David. So I said last week that it takes humility to be able to be say, a save, to save for God, to be able to be used by him as a savior. But what we'll see with David today is that it still takes humility to be saved by God. It takes humility to be a savior for God so that he can use you to bring someone else out of a bad situation. But it takes humility to be the one who is being saved. It takes humility for that as well. As I said last week, you know, David was used to being the hero. This time he needs to receive a hero. He needs to be saved, and he needs to be able to see that. Why does he need a savior? Well, David in this is on the absolute verge of sin. He's on the verge of sin. And just to break it down, he's on the verge of the sin of pride, right? He's all hot-headed, taking it personally. Now, Nabal, of course, gave him an insulting answer. Yes, you've done all this for my men, and yes, custom says that I should pay you and your men. I should allow you to come to the feast and celebrate because you've protected my, my property, protected my goods. But he sends him away empty-handed and insulted um, in, in the bargain. Now, David, though, before, with Goliath, he's concerned for God's honor back then, wasn't he? You know, oh, who is this Philistine that's, you know, talking against the, defying the, the God of Israel, the God of, of, of the Lord of hosts. So back then, he's taking it for God. But here, this is personal. This is personal now, where David is being prideful and taking it personally, okay? And he's not taking it well. Not taking it well, decides that he's going to react in anger and he's going to wipe these people out. So he's acting on the sin of pride when he's being prideful, when really he should have been prayerful. You know, how many Psalms are there where David, Lord, look, he's not, not above. To, look at them. Lord, do you see? Father God, do you see this? Do you? <sighs> you know, that was good enough for him later on, but he hadn't learned that lesson quite yet. Not well enough anyway. So rather than do that, say, God, you look, he's going to lead lean on his own understanding. And Proverbs 3, 5, 6 tells us that we don't do that. We lean on our own, if we acknowledge God in all that we do so that he can smooth our path. So David, in his sin of pride, is about to make a whole heap of trouble for himself just by leaning on his own understanding and deciding that he's going to act um, pridefully. But alongside the sin of pride is also the sin of presumption. Okay, so he was being hot-headed and prideful, but now he's going to do the sin of presumption. He's going to be high-handed, high-handed, right? He not only took it personally, but now he's going to take care of it personally. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to take my 400 men, and we're going to 
kill them all, massacre them all, I'll show him. I will show him for treating me that way, talking to me, talking to me. Does he not know that I'm the future king of Israel? Does he not know? Do you know, you know, people always, do you know who I am? You ever see that in a fight? Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? <laughs> My dad's bigger than your dad. Yes, which is what he really should have said, actually. <laughs> and it's the truth, you know. Prophetically spoken, very nice. But yes, it's always, do you know who I am and all this prideful stuff? And I'm going to show you and I'm going to take care of it. The sin of presumption, it is not his place. I don't care how, how um, offended he is. It is not his place. You know, as we, and we'll read something in Deuteronomy that reminds us. But that sin of presumption, that sin of pride, taking it on himself, um, and then, you know, there's also the sin of premeditated murder. He's going to kill someone. We can go all the way back to Genesis 9, 5 and 6, and it just reminds us that if we're going to take blood, God's going to require that. And it's not just people. It's animals as well. Okay? Anyone who spills blood, it is a problem. Okay? And you will have to answer to God for it, animals or people. So David surely must know this but it doesn't stop him because he's being prideful, he's being presumptuous, and now he's even gone so far as to contemplate premeditated murder. OTT, totally disproportionate, okay? One man has insulted you and you're gonna wipe out a whole cast of them? A whole heap of males? What's that about? What is that about? So these are the sins that, that David is on the verge of committing. He's on the express track of going from hero to absolute zero, just completely mucking it up. You know, and I just want to dwell for a moment on this, this sin of avenging ourselves, because that's at the heart of this. You know, God says that vengeance is mine, I, I will repay. That's what God says. But So why does it matter to him? Because if we fight our own battles, and I'm not saying that we don't feel upset when someone unjustly treats us, whether they say something nasty to us, whether it, uh, they stab us in the back, they say something about our family, you know, they cheat us out of something, of course we, we feel angry, we feel hurt, we feel confused, and we want to do something about it. You know, but God sees, God sees. If we do something about it ourselves, we're showing that we're in, that we're saying that we believe God is indifferent. He doesn't care. God doesn't care. Doesn't care what happens to me. So I'm going to have to do something about it because he couldn't possibly care or he wouldn't just allow, allow this. So we're saying that God is indifferent. But we're also saying that God is impotent. Well, he can't take care of it, so I, I better do this. You know, Lord, I, I've got this one. I've got, thank you, but I've got this one. You know, you, you probably need me to, yeah, okay. So God is indifferent, God is impotent. And then we're also saying, if we try to defend ourselves, avenge ourselves, we're saying that God is immaterial. He's insignificant. I know you're there, but so what? I'm going to take care of this. I know you've said that. I don't care. I'm going to take care of this. I don't care what your word says. I don't care what my attitude is saying towards you. You're immaterial and insignificant. So in avenging ourselves, defending ourselves, like David was getting ready to do, we're saying that God is indifferent. He does not care. God is impotent. He couldn't possibly do anything about this. His attitude towards me is wrong. His ability to do anything for me doesn't exist. And immaterial and insignificant, he has no authority over me either. Now, this may not be our intention, but that's what our actions say when we defend ourselves and don't leave it to God to take care of it. This is effectively what David was saying. Hence, Abigail, you want to check yourself. As I said last week, before you wreck yourself, you're about to step into a major problem here. You know, we cannot avenge ourselves. And all of those attitudes, saying God's indifferent, impotent, or um, insignificant, that is the words, those are the thoughts and the ways, not of the faithful, but of a fool. Psalm 14.1 reminds us, it's the fool that says in his heart that there is no God. The fool. This is what we would expect from the ball. Who's God? You know, he, he was saying, who's David, who's the son of Jesse, you know, but what he's ultimately saying is, who's God? You know, God's anointed this guy to be the future king of Israel. Who's God? It's a Pharaoh moment. Who is your God that I should pay any attention? What, what a question. Is there God? Okay, but who is God? You know, that, 
that's getting to be a bit more serious. That's getting to be insulting, but it's foolish. And from a person who's supposed to be a man of God, from people who are supposed to be children of the living God, it's foolish. Not saying that sometimes we don't cry out in despair, God, where are you? Do you not see? I mean, you know, Lord, oh Lord, how long will you stand by and do nothing? That's one question. That's born out of frustration. But to take it on your own hands is to say that you're not there, and if you are there, you're not going to do anything, and you can't do anything. It's two different things. You can be frustrated and call out in despair. Of course we can. But remember and leave room for God to actually act because he will act. Um, I'm going to have to read it from here because um, Deuteronomy 20, 32, 32, it's a very long reading, but it, it's important, and I'm going to read it all because it is important that we recognize, as I say, no matter how long you are in your situation, no matter how deep the offense that somebody has caused to you, you have to know that God is watching, okay, taking note of it all, and he certainly will take care of it all. So Deuteronomy, um, what is it, 32, starting at 34, have I not kept this in reserve and sealed it in my vaults, i.e., I'm taking notes, okay? This is God. I am watching. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. The Lord will vindicate his people and relent concerning his servants when he sees their strength is gone and no one is left, slave or free. He will say, now where are their gods, the rock they took refuge in, talking about the, the enemies of God's people, the gods who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up to help you. Let them give you shelter. See now that I myself am he. And this is where our comfort is. And I love it when God says this uh, in different places in the Bible. There is no God besides me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is no God. I don't care what people tell you about many paths, other religions, God's own words. There is nobody but me. I am your only hope. I am the one and only. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. Nabal knows that, doesn't he? I have wounded and I will heal. And no one, no one, I love the power of God. No one can deliver out of my hand. I lift my hand to heaven and solemnly swear as surely as I live forever. This is God. <laughs> when I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh. The blood of the slain and the captives, the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will, he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. Drop the mic. God drops the mic. <laughs> what else is there to say? So, you know, <laughs> and what else is there to say? This is why, this is why David was on, on the the verge of making such a horrible and deep sin. This is the God that he served. This is the God that we serve, you know. And uh, my, I think my mom, like me, loves it when God speaks. She likes, she loves to hear God more in the Old Testament than in the New because he's always like in your face like that, you know. But it's important because it is the same God. You know, we think about Jesus and I know, um, Mandy will talk to you about uh, David and being that prototype of the shepherd king, but we think of Jesus when he first came as the lamb, but we know that he is also the lion. He is also the lion. So yes, there is love, but there is judgment and there is vengeance to be had. If you're going to spit in God's face, don't expect that he's not going to pay that back. It doesn't mean that we cannot err. Okay, but there are those who the Bible tells us, even at the end, you know, that weeping and gnashing of teeth as people are crying out, oh, you know, Jesus is Lord, but not, 
Jesus is Lord. It's like, dear Jesus, you know, sneering through gritted teeth because they refuse to bow and refuse to acknowledge. You know, God is not going to strive with us, with man forever. He will have his vengeance. And when somebody brings a fight, an argument, uh, an offense or whatever to you, as with David, David got that earlier. You know, they're not defying us. They're, they're not really getting at us. They're getting at God. You know, that's why he says the battle is mine and I will repay. That's why Satan is considered to be our adversary. That's why he's spoken of as being the accuser of the brethren. And what was it that David had said to Saul? I will let the Lord plead my case and judge between me and you. There is this court, this spiritual court, right? In the spirit, in the heavenly realms. We're not fit we're not fit to plead the case with the father of lies. You know, I love to make an argument. I'm very good if I'm quite, you know, <laughs> if I'm honest, I think I'm good. But I'm not good enough to make an argument with Satan. I'm not that stupid, and I'm not that arrogant, and I'm not that wise, and I'm certainly not that good. But God is. So we have to leave it to him. We have a hellish adversary, yeah, but we have a heavenly advocate that can plead our case in the heavenlies and here on earth as well. We have to leave it to the Lord to repay. We just, we have to, you know, but our only job is to, like it says in Ephesians 6, you know, you strap on that spiritual armor, strap it on, you engage in prayer, and you just stand, you know, you just stand. Be strong in the Lord and in his, might, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes and here. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, and you know this, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what are we called to do? Put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, we may be able to stand your ground. Right? Don't say fight, just stand, stand your ground. And after you've done everything, stand, stand firm, stand, 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 stand firm with the belt of truth and, uh, you know, the breastplate of righteousness and with your feet, with the shoes of the gospel of peace and shield of faith so that you can extinguish the arrows, helmet of salvation. And what am I looking for? And this often gets left off when people are talking about the spiritual armor, but it's all there, part of the same passage. Pray pray. Oh, you know, there's a, um, in the spirit, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Okay. And be alert and be praying for all the Lord's people. So that's how we fight. Yeah. If you want to fight for yourself and you want to fight for your family, stay strapped up in the, the armor of God, stand, pray. That's all there is. That's all there is. That's what we wanted to fight for you, Ben. And that's all we could do was stand and pray. And we prayed. And we continue to pray. And atmospheres were changed. And thank God you're here. I can't tell you what a blessing it is to see the three of you here this morning. God bless you. You know, you know. You, he's using you for his glory, all of you, you know, um, as a family. But we fought the only way we knew how. The only way that we're told to. And look at the results that it yielded. And so David, amen, amen, and bringing it back, you know, to, to close this story out, David finally got it and uh, balanced what seems to be the, his warrior nature is always, always sort of rearing up. But David is a worshiper as well. He does know God. He does love God. And so finally, it's him that, you know, says when to Abigail, verse 32, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me this day. Blessed be you for your discernment. And you know what? Just bless you. You've kept me from bloodshed and avenging my own hand. He finally recognizes I'm about to go against God's authority. I'm about to try to exceed um, God's ability in, in, in doing this. I, I'm, about, I'm just acting in pride. I'm just acting in pride. So he recognizes. And I think the key, again, you have to be humble in order to be saved by God. So God sent Abigail. She restrained David. All she did was kind of hold him up, though, right? She met him in the way, and she held him up. It was David who actually himself had to hold back. 
he had to hold back. So God re restrained David, but David himself had to make a choice to refrain from the evil that he was about to do. He had to choose to refrain from the sin that he was about to engage in. Um, and, you know, I won't go through all those verses again, but he recognizes God's hand in this. He does. And so because David, and of course we have to deal with Nabal, but because David refrained, God then repaid. So if humility allows you to be saved, to save for God, it allows you to be saved by God, but by the same token, or on the flip side, without humility, you cannot be saved from God. Because as we read, he's going to get you. Okay? He's going to get you if you go against him. And what happens, we know, Nabal, when he hears about what's happening, first he's struck dumb or whatever, or like stone. So some people say it's a heart attack. Some people say it's a stroke. And then 10 days later, though, it specifically says, verse 38, the Lord struck Nabal dead. So, David, you got what you wanted um, in the end, even though, you know, we won't go into his motives. But he was repaid because Nabal was disrespecting the Lord's anointed, the Lord's anointed future king of Israel. So he had to pay for that because he's fighting against God. You know, he's not just uh, fighting against David or uh, disregarding David as a man, but it was because David refrained that that opened the door for God then to be able to repay, you know, which is, he was always going to do that. If we leave room for the Lord to act, then he will. He, he's made it very clear um, that he will. You know, it's God's prerogative, as I say, to decide how he's going to to repay or avenge us when somebody comes against us. Um, unlike David, God, again, was very precise. David was going to kill everybody. God just kills Nabal. And he was very proportionate. You know, one guy, one guy's offended you. I'll take care of that. But what's with the mass slaughter? No, can't have that. You know, you're meant to be my future king. You're meant to shepherd my people. I can't have them running from you in fear because you're covered in blood. You know, for no good reason. You know, as Abigail said, um, shedding blood without cause. Because she talked about him fighting the battles of the Lord. And she's, in a way, she's telling him, this is not one of those. Okay? I understand how you feel. My husband's a fool. He, he riled you. And you fight the battles of the Lord. But this is not one. And this is not the time. And this is not the way. Um, and praise God, um, David did uh, respond to, to the Lord's um, restraint. So I say all that to say it is about humility. Um, with humility, God can use us to save. With humility, we can actually be saved by the Lord. Without humility, um, you cannot be saved from God, and he will um, have his vengeance. So my question for all of us today um, is where do we stand? You know, where do we stand? Where is it that you're riled by injustice in some way? towards yourself, towards your family? Where is it that maybe you need to take a step back and recognize that no matter, no matter how angry someone's making you, God can always do more to them than what you can. It will be proportionate. It will be timely. It will be perfect. And I don't say that we should be sat around waiting, rubbing our hands, ooh, you're going to get yours, you know, <laughs> even though we may feel that way, <laughs> if I'm honest. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think the key is to remember that it's not – you that the people have the issue with and I mean this is the whole spiritual realm isn't it people don't even realize sometimes why they have an issue with you but if you stop look at their life look at your own you do know you know you can know because simply the fact that you carry the spirit of the living God within you um I remember once I was on the on the underground in New York City and I, I was like I was a new Christian at that point and there the all sorts of odd people on the underground, as you've seen in films, I'm sure. Uh, it's true, unfortunately. And so there was this, um, I can't remember if it was a man or a woman, but sat next to me. And I had this thing in New York. I, w I won't move from somebody just because they seem strange, because they probably get that all day. So I thought, oh, okay. You know, and I normally had my headphones on all the time. So, you know, sitting on the train, <laughs> listening to that. And uh, so I would start hearing all this <coughs> muttering and whatever. I'm like, okay, you know, and I'm still listening to my music. <laughs> and I uh, always have my sunglasses on as well. <laughs> and uh, so I'm hearing this one. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like, <clears throat> and I'm hearing more and more, and I'm thinking, okay, at this point, I'm discerning there's a problem, but it's more than just, this person's not just crazy. I think there's something wrong. So, you know, I'm like, oh, I just start praying or whatever as I'm listening to him, and the muttering gets stronger, and I'm like, okay, I think there really <laughs> is a problem here, but I don't have any experience, you know, with any of that sort of thing. But I thought, okay, they could have sat anywhere, but why are you sitting here? Why, if you know that I'm from the other side, you know, and you're clearly within the realms of Satan, why would you come and sit next to me? Just to cause trouble, because that's what the enemy does, roves about like a roaming lion, see who he can pick off. New Christian, all full of the joys and that, I'll see if I can, you know, get her to run, if nothing else, and maybe I should have done, but, you know, I continued to pray. Luckily, I think they got off before I did and stuff, but you just, you know, Back then, I wouldn't have seen that so easily for what it is. But nowadays, I think Lisa, like I was saying yesterday, you just see. You see things. And I know you probably wish you didn't see, you know, what you do. And that's why you have that gift and I don't. Because <laughs> I probably would just, I don't know. But, yeah, you know, the other side knows before we do. Um, and so there are lots of battles to be had. But the Lord's got it. And he's got you. Uh, and, and that's what we, we've got to, to stick to. So, yeah, I just... Um, Whatever God has perhaps said to you this morning, turn it over to him. Turn it over to him. Don't be like a Nabal. Don't try to either stand up against the Lord thinking that, you know, he's not going to address uh, something. And don't be like David and try to take it into your own hands. Let him fight for you. You know, David was looking for a wage, right, from Nabal. And he ended up with a good wife and great wealth. So much more than a, a couple of peanuts, you know. God gave him the whole plantation, as it were. So, uh, yeah, I think that's everything. Bless you. <laughs>